I've been in Ethereum since 2014, uh, worked in a C++ client in the Solidity compiler, uh, did DAO stuff, White Hat and the ATC and DAO Wars back then. Then I worked on uh, L2 payments for many years and founded Rotkey. Um, today, I will be talking about user transactions and um, how we can start to understand them, like what are they and um, how can we decode them in a human readable format. Uh, everybody has used Ethereum in here, um, and we have all faced these two big problems. Like, you do not know um, when you have a transaction, you do not know how to get it. Like, there is no built-in way to get transactions for an address. You need to utilize some kind of third-party service, and that will never be decentralized. Also, once you have these transactions, you really don't know what I mean. There is a complete lack of a universal tool that will decode um, a transaction to human readable format. There is some third party services, but again, uh, they are centralized and they tend to be protocol specific. What does a transaction look like? Everybody has opened Etherscan and sees this, you know, hex blob. There is no metadata, there is no human readable info. That's what every new user to Ethereum is greeted with. There is no way to understand what um, your transaction, like three, four years ago, has done. There are ways, we are no longer in 2014, there are ways to gain insights. So you can see stuff in Etherscan um, with the graph and other centralized APIs such as Covalent, Morales, etc. Um, so we have all used Etherscan. What are the ways to um, decode the transaction with Etherscan is that um, it looks like this. this is a complicated transaction that does swaps over multiple protocols. Um, it's easy to use, you just type in Etherscan, you know, transaction slash the has. And it gives you useful insight, and it's totally free. Uh, of course, it, there are cons with Etherscan that's centralized. Um, it's proprietary and closed source. That means that you, there is no way for um, me as a developer to see how they do what they do or extend it in any way. Um, they know everything about you. I mean, I know the guys from Etherscan, they are good guys, but you never know who in there could be malicious. Uh, they can uh, match IPs uh, to your addresses and know who owns what address and where they are located. And it actually does not decode everything. We've all seen that there are uh, transactions that Etherscan doesn't like, have insights for, uh, and there are other tools that actually can do this. The graph um, is a way, it's kind of an indexer per protocol. You, they have subgraphs, and they index the chain for a particular protocol, and then you can query this index and get any insight you want. Um, the, cons, uh, so the pros is that it's very good for single protocol data. So, for example, here we have the Aave v2 Ethereum by Messari. Um, this is the subgraph that say the Aave guys can run in their um, interface and query any information they want for their protocol. But uh, it has many, many disadvantages. Um, it needs payment per query. Um, this is their vision that everybody should be paying for every query. Uh, it's built for single protocol data, so the, the subgraphs. So it, there is no generic solution. Um, if you have a portfolio tracker or a wallet or something that wants to decode every single transaction, no matter what protocol it is in, subgraphs will not work. You will have to basically query every single subgraph and create a subgraph for everything that doesn't, uh, is not supported yet. Um, and it does not work with uh, local apps, what I like to call true dApps. So basically, uh, when the company that makes the application hosts, um, uh, hosts the code, they can have an API key and pay for the queries. But when it's a local application, there is no way for this to, to happen. And there are these other centralized APIs like Covalent, Morales, and Alchemy. They're easy to use. They have pretty cool APIs um, uh, which can decode transactions, uh, give you all the transactions. But the same concept that can apply. Like it's centralized, it knows everything about you, it's proprietary, so you cannot extend it. it it's not modular at all. Um, so having seen the ways that we can get insights about data. Let's see how we can actually get accurate historical data. And let's go to the original scene of Ethereum. Like, this is absolutely bonkers. If any of you has tried to get um, the history of transactions for your address, you will find out very easily that there is absolutely no built-in way to do this for, um, uh, for Ethereum. There is no RPC method. Uh, this is all due to the way that um, EVM works and how the clients are built. 
But it is really like it's absolutely crazy that there is no way for you as a user to get all of the transactions for your address. Someone that comes as a developer outside from Web3 and comes to Ethereum and sees this, they think that we are, we are, we are just crazy, that this is broken. Uh, it's, it's not all gloom and doom, though. There are ways to do this. Etherscan, again, comes to the rescue. They have many APIs. And if you combine three, I think, um, so this one for, for transactions, then there is one for ERC20 transfer and one for NFTs. If you combine all of them, you get a pretty accurate picture of what transactions your address has done. Of course, it has drawbacks, right? It doesn't detect all address appearances. It's rate limited, but you can pay for bigger limits. But rate limiting means that it takes time for your query to actually uh, work. It is centralized, so it can go uh, down, they can cut access to the API, or um, they can uh, do what I said before, that they can monitor you and map IP to um, your address. The truly decentralized way to go around this is something by my friend Thomas J. Ras. It's called TrueBlocks. It is really the best and most complete way um, to get transaction data. Um, TrueBlocks detects all appearances of an address. Really, I have seen demos um, where uh, TJ basically shows Etherscan and then compares it with TrueBlocks, and you can see that for some addresses, TrueBlocks does indeed detect more appearances than Etherscan. It is decentralized, so it runs on top of your local node, so you do not need to, to do any other network queries. It's super fast. Like, it's really like milliseconds or seconds, depending on the amount of um, addresses that you query for. Uh, and it's built to share the, this index with others. Of course, like, like with everything in software, there is drawbacks. Um, it is hard to set up. So TJ is like, he was a long wolf since I met him in, in uh, Shanghai in 2016. Now he has a bit bigger team, but it's, it, it takes time to build something that's easy to use by others. It does require a local node, so you need to be running an Eregon node, I think. I'm not sure if it works with others. Um, and of course, you require TrueBlocks itself to create the index. Um, so building on this, I would like to like, present what I try to call the stack of true decentralization, which is something that we should be striving, striving for in crypto. So everybody should try to run their own node, so something like a DAP node or um, a Raspberry Pi with whatever setup you guys want to have. Um, you should run your own client, right? Like for whatever chain you have, run a client for that chain that you want to, um, to use. And um, TrueBlox actually works for all chains, all EVM chains. Uh, so you can have an indexer like TrueBlox on top that will index the chain and provide you uh, an answer to the question how the heck, um, so what addresses, uh, sorry, what transactions does my address have? And on top of it all, to come and bind it all, um, you have the aggregating and decoding level that uh, something like Rotki, but not uh, um, like a decoding. So Rotki right now is a, um, an application, but imagine a platform where you can have a generic way to uh, go from transactions to a common readable format for what they do. And it's actually consumable by humans. Uh, going from how we get data to what actually would go into this decoding platform that, I was, that uh, my talk is about. So once you have all the data, like either from Etherscan or from TrueBlocks, um, what kind of data is this? Um, if you have tried to play with uh, understanding transaction history of Ethereum, you know that there is two ways to get um, uh, data. It's either a trace, a transaction trace, or transaction receipts. Um, there are two kinds of traces. One is the GIF style trace, and the other is a parity trace. I'm going to go through them a bit fast for those of you who do not know what they are. So GIF style trace is the tracing that comes with a GIF client. Um, when a transaction um, happens, it touches, uh, multi so it touches multiple contracts, right? So you make a transaction to a contract, and this one may make a call to another contract, and so on and so forth. And as they do this, they touch the state of these contracts, and they, they make some changes. So this is what the uh, trace of a transaction is. And the GIF style trace is the most uh, complete. It's like super detailed. It has every single step of the execution with um, the uh, opcode, the program counter, the uh, storage diff, etc. It's super detailed. It's very hard to use because for complicated transactions, you have like a huge thing that you don't really know what it does. And it can grow extremely huge, uh, like in the gigabytes for really complicated transactions. Um, then we have the parity style trace, which comes from the now defunct parity client. But it is used, uh, I think, Ergon for sure, and Nethermind, and maybe, maybe Besu. I'm not sure. Um, they have three commands. Uh, one is a trace that's pretty cool and useful. Um, it gives you a call stack like this. 
of what uh, did your um, transaction do, the, like uh, the, the call trace of the transaction. And this actually does not require an archive node. Uh, by the way, the screenshot is from um, a, a very nice um, article by Banteg on traces that came out like two months ago, I think. So Google like Banteg and transaction traces, and you will um, uh, you can read about it in more detail. And the other thing that um, you can use to understand how a transaction, um, what has it done, is the um, parity style trace diff. Uh, it gives you a state diff. For, so for each account that you touch, it gives you the difference in balance, code, nonce, and storage. The cool thing is here, if you have the ABI, you can play with it a bit, and you can have uh, readable names for the storage slots and how did they change. So this is a very useful insight on what did the transaction uh, do. And of course, then transaction receipts. Um, we've all um, seen like the, how a source code of a contract looks like. They have um, events. These events are actually contained in something that's called the transaction receipt. So let's say for a, a token transfer, it's, a, I don't know, like transfer source destination and value or something. Um, almost everything generates them. Um, it looks like, like this. this is ah. It's all hex, but if you have the ABI of the, um, the contract, you can decode this into a human readable format. Uh, this is how you gather that data, but um, gathering this data is actually expensive. It takes time, um, and exactly because this is expensive in, um, in resources, persistence is key. So any kind of platform that you create, and the thing that we have created at Rotkey, needs to have data persistence. Um, you can choose various ways. We've gone with a simple um, SQLite database for now, but um, this way, when you have gathered all of the data and you know that they are true and will not change, then um, you can just take it out of the database and reuse it instead of having to requery again uh, true blocks or etherscan or make a trace again. Uh, we talked about uh, where you can get uh, data, how to get it, and then I'm going to go to the meat of the um, uh, presentation, which is the decoders themselves. Um, so we want to get human readable um, format of the transaction data. Uh, yes, of the transaction data. So. We have gotten either um, receipts uh, or traces. And with this amazing Inkscape um, uh, graphic that I made, guys, I'm really proud of myself for this. We can see that um, you can check for its um, uh, receipt, for its uh, log, the address, and then send it depending on the address to uh, either the generic ERC20 transfer decoder, if it's a Uniswap uh, swap to the Uniswap decoder, and so on and so forth, like Ave, etc. And all of this will at the end um, emit a common uh, event format. What's more, uh, some decoders feed data to other decoders. So the ERC20 transfers create the ERC20 transfer event, and this gets fed to Uniswap, which translates it into swaps. Such a decoder um, platform is made on modularity. Uh, this is um, Rotkis repo, and this is where we have all the decoders, and it's like a huge list. It doesn't have all of them. Um, because they don't fit on the screenshot. But the idea is that it's easy to write, easy to use, and drag and drop. That you just drag, uh, so you drop it in there, and it's caught by the, the system. And then a new decoder is taken into account whenever we, um, we, we decode a transaction. That's the idea. Uh, we're not there yet. We build binaries, and uh, this is not as modular as it should be, but the idea is that it should just um, uh, big drag and drop. Um, this is uh, how the source code looks like. Uh, this is, I think, a yeah, hop protocol to bridge to uh, another chain. So um, it's hard to read, probably, but the idea is that um, you get from the ERC20 transfer decoder, you get the um, ERC20 transfer, and then you see, oh, it's a spend. The counterparty is the F bits of uh, hop, and the asset of F matches and the amount matches. So then we transform it into the common event format for uh, HOP and give it a nice readable um, uh, explanation, which is like bridge the amount of ETH to um, either your own address or to some other address in the chain, uh, so the name of the chain, via HOP protocol. Uh, I talk a lot about the common event format. It's kind of a POC because we are, um, we are our only consumer right now. Uh, it's uh, changing, so this is how it looks in the code. Um, it has like a sequence index inside the transaction, so where did it happen in the transaction? Timestamp, location, 
Location is mostly uh, something that we use in Rotki because we um, subtract everything into this format, not only um, Ethereum transactions, but uh, your Kraken trades, uh, your Ethereum staking, everything gets uh, subtracted into this uh, um, least common denominator format. Um, we have the history type, uh, history event type, and history event subtype. So this is what defines the meat of how you define um, uh, an event. The asset and the balance change. And then some extra stuff like the location label is uh, along the counterparty is if I, I sent it from me to someone or if I got from someone else. And uh, some extra data, like if it's a CDP for Maker, we have the CDP ID here, etc. Um, as I said, everything is broken down into this thing. Uh, like a swap is three of these events. So it's um, amount out, amount in, and fee out. Uh, or it can be two if there is no fee. Uh, we are working on this. Uh, it's not final, but this is like the idea. Uh, this is how a front end can consume and show this um, uh, code. Uh, this should be read, unfortunately, because the, um, I didn't take a nice screenshot from the bottom to the uh, um, top. So I claim my badger airdrop. Uh, so it has two events the gas fee that's burned and the airdrop claiming. Then approval to one inch v2 and the gas fee for this, and then the swap for, uh, in one inch for uh, basically immediately dumping the, um, uh, the tokens. This is the same thing that you saw in the, in, the previous, in the previous screenshot, basically, these events. Each one of them is one line here. Uh, so this is how they are consumed in, in Rotkey itself, which is a portfolio training application. Um, so uh, I would like to actually also talk a little bit about the abstraction layer of, uh, of uh, the vision of Rotkey, which is like if you take this a step further and not just focus on um, uh, just EVM code, but anything, like any um, event, um, you can get into like an open source middleware that offers an abstraction layer for everything, accounts, balances, PNL, over multiple protocols and jurisdictions. So this is kind of the vision that we would like at some point to go with Rotkey. Um, so we went from a portfolio turning up to um, a common EVM decoder, and now more towards a middleware that would offer an abstraction for everything in, in um, accounting for crypto. Uh, why? Right? Like people would ask, what the heck? Why, why would you need this? Because everybody is reinventing the wheel. Uh, there is, again, as I said, different protocols, different uh, exchanges, chains, uh, jurisdictions. It's impossible to keep up. I have, talk, I have spoken with people in uh, uh, both small startups and big um, names in the field for portfolio trading and crypto accounting. Everybody is saying that this is just too much to keep up. Uh, maintaining just one module is a, a full-time job. Um, so I believe that there is a solution to this problem. So the problem of everybody reinventing the wheel has a solution that um, we can have an open source uh, platform, or middleware if you want, maintained by a core team, but with contributors uh, from the entire industry and used by multiple projects. And for the problem of um, different protocols and jurisdictions and um, being it impossible for a single organization to keep up, I would like to propose a solution that um, we can have people incentivized from each chain and protocol um, with appropriate know-how to come and implement modules in this um, platform. Again, my amazing Inkscape skills. Um, imagine a middleware where you have like someone who wants to use um, uh, to do portfolio trading accounting, has um, the, the core, uses Bitcoin and Ethereum, plugs in the Yen module, the Ave module. He also wants to do accounting plugs in the accounting module, and because he's in Germany, he plugs in the German accounting uh, with FIFO, multiple depot, and LIFO um, accounting methods. Uh, and imagine this middleware basically being used by many people in the field, and um, in the end, just everything plugging into this. Because it's better to use a common open source uh, middleware rather than every single application reinventing the wheel. Uh, any such platform w would have like, some super basic requirements. It needs to be open source. Like everybody does, tries to reinvent the wheel in a proprietary, um, closed source way. This is just absolutely idiotic. 
it needs to have a modular architecture so that, um, as we saw before, like be pluggable, have pluggable modules. Um, you, you are in a different country than Germany, you can just plug the, I don't know, Netherlands accounting module. You don't use um, Ether, uh, Ethereum, you use uh, Kusama, you do the substrate uh, module, and you can do all the Polkadot, Kusama, etc. Uh, it needs to have, uh, this is a hard requirement to achieve, but it needs to be multilingual. It needs to have multilingual bindings. Because we at Trotky were a Python uh, house. We know how to use other languages, but most of our code is in Python. Such a middleware should not uh, uh, limit the user. To, uh, so we, we cannot ask the entire industry to switch to, 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 to Python if they are to, to use such a thing. The platform should be built in a multilingual way. Um, and as for incentivization, the creators and maintainers of modules should be incentivized to uh, actually contribute to this platform. If it becomes an open source standard, then everybody should be like, oh, wait, I mean, we, we made this new platform. Uh, we need to write a Rotkey module for it also, because otherwise it's just uh, like nobody will use it. And the core team that builds and maintains it also needs to be incentivized in, in some way in order to be able to keep uh, uh, building. The ways that this can be is through um, support to the various um, teams or through uh, SLAs for um, uh, software level agreements for um, companies that may not want to have open source code, so you can have the dual licensing. Uh, so, it's a bit funny, I wanted to show, the, I saw the timeline thing and I was uh, in the um, uh, template that they gave us and I thought, hey, why not put a timeline? So, how the heck did we get here? 2017, I just needed to do my taxes in crypto. And I was like, okay, I'm not gonna, w w what is the, the way to do this? There was Bitcoin.tax, there was nothing else back then. I'm not gonna use a centralized service, like, I just don't trust them. So, I just made some Python CLI scripts, it worked. I've not been sued by the German government yet, so it worked, I don't know. Um, and later built a UI around them. In 2020, we made it into a company. We were a team of two people, and maybe we had 200 users, 300, and maybe 10 paid. Um, so last year, uh, the app had grown. We hired one more developer, and we were 2,000 users and 200 paying users. In the beginning of this year, uh, there is many people who use Rotkey right now. Um, some like it, some complain they always want more and more, but it is at um, a level that many people can use it. We are a team of seven now. 6,000, uh, around 6,000 users, it's hard to know because we, it's an open source app and we don't have analytics. Um, and 500 pay, 550 paying users. We came all this way without uh, anything, like it was just completely bootstrapped. And from um, uh, basically your donations through Gitcoin and from integrations, with um, uh, other uh, companies, like uh, Optimism gave us a grant lately, before that there were Kusama, and so on and so forth. Um, so, for getting this POC that I described here to the full uh, Rotkey vision, we would need to uh, go further from here and try to grow and potentially get some funding, because uh, with the current team that we have, it's well impossible to actually build this vision. The POC cannot grow to a level of something that can be used by the entire industry with just six people, six developers. This is just impossible. Um, so with this, I'm coming to the closing notes. Um, so if you like the stuff that you had, like uh, open source, local affairs, the modular thing that can be used by everybody in the industry, um, then please uh, talk to me or check out, yeah, this thing again. Check out rotkey.com jobs. Um, we have some open positions. Um, we came here thanks to you, like seriously, it's a bootstrap uh, project and we would not be here without Gitcoin donations and without uh, our premium users. So keep supporting us. Um, you can donate in uh, Gitcoin grants or in um, buy premium uh, subscription and unlock all of the features of uh, Rotkey. And you can join our community in Twitter or Discord, like that's where all the support is. It would be pretty cool for you to, if you can um, uh, join the chat and join our community. And if you're interested in helping us grow, in realizing this vision that I try to present here, uh, then talk to me either like any day in the conference or write an email to lefteris at uh, rotkey.com. Uh, yes, with that, that's all. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, like you mentioned the graph and true blocks. The yes. one thing that I don't understand about these two tools 
is the, to query historical data is that they use a client node and this node is basically in charge of storing this data in an SQL database. Isn't this a centralized way of saving data? Is this when IPFS comes into play? And if that's the case, can you explain how IPFS and an SQL database work together to solve this? Well, IPFS doesn't come anywhere in there. Like, uh, the graph is, uh, and Truebox completely different things. So the graph is, um, it creates an index on top of um, your already existing um, uh, node data. And Truebox does the same, but Truebox does it in a generic way for all of your transactions, while the graph has specialized subgraphs written by developers of a particular protocol that uh, uh, basically write an indexer just for this protocol. And this lives on top of um, your node data. It is decentralized. Like, the graph by design is also decentralized. Truebox is itself also decentralized. It creates this index, and this index is shared um, I think it's pinned in IPFS and shared with others who use Trueblocks. I'm not totally sure on the details of sharing of Trueblocks because I'm not a developer, but I think that this is how they do it. As for the graph, they have a decentralized network. If I'm understanding this right, the idea is if we build this out um, and get it out there, then like we could get around using services like Tenderly and just basically run Tenderly at home for transaction tracing and simulations and all that? Yeah. Um, I view it more from a historical perspective, and Tenderly is a current emulator. But uh, yeah, I suppose that you could also do the same. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Tenderly is proprietary, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I think that they work with traces. They are pretty good, but yeah, proprietary. With such a design, yes, I believe that we could uh, yeah, use this as an alternative. Hola, awesome presentation, great work. Uh, from the developer perspective on, on a Solidity developer, I think it would be very useful for, for example, I write a smart contract and I write the decoder. Let's say I write the decoder and I host it on IPFS. Have you thought about that, like how we can have like a standardized, I don't know, let's say a variable where we define the URI or hash where we set our decoder and you guys can use it because you have a list of decoders on GitHub, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is just a different uh, medium of, of uh, delivering the decoder. But yes, the idea is exactly what you described. So I'm not going to write every decoder. My team is not going to write every decoder. That's impossible. Yeah. Uh, but the idea is exactly that you, when you write your smart contract for a protocol, then you say, OK, I'm also going to write a decoder for this. And then somehow it should be delivered to the, this middleware. Yes, it can be through a yeah. link. It can. This is just a POC of what we have right now, the yeah, yeah. drag and drop in the folder in GitHub. I think it, it does it a lot of value if you can also validate the decoder. Because if I do it, I can write a malicious decoder, but we will need like a validation system. And this, I, this is a place where I think you can add a lot of value. OK. Yeah, that's, that's good feedback. Thank you, guys.